The longest running monarch in Britain's history, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary, or more commonly known as Queen Elizabeth II, died on September 8, 2022 in Scotland at Balmoral Castle, where she had been for the past few months. She had reigned for 70 years, becoming queen at the tender young age of 26, and had been the first monarch to celebrate the Jubilee, a celebration of 70 years on the throne. Now there will be many obituaries out there, but I want to focus on and try to answer the question on how did she actually die? What was she doing up in Scotland? Why was she not taken to hospital? Did she really have bone cancer? Did Harry and Meghan really bring on this disease and demise as claimed by Lady Campbell? Hi, welcome back to the channel. My name is Dr. Aziz. I'm a physician based in the UK. Now apologies for the first video. It was done hastily after a long shift, so there were multiple issues with the audio, I understand. This video is two things. A fix of that video, so that one you can hear clearly if you want an accurate medical analysis of the Queen's death. And secondly, an analysis of what Lady Campbell had to say, because I appreciate that a lot of people see her as reliable, but from a purely medical perspective, there are some serious concerns about what she has been claiming, and I will come on to them shortly. Now, at the outset, it has to be said that still until now, no official cause of death has been released by the royal family. In the UK, there is no obligation for a cause of death or autopsy report to be made public, so we may never be informed of the official cause of death. What I will be doing in this video is mention what I feel, in my medical opinion, was the cause of the Queen's death, the health issues leading up to her demise, and whether in fact anything could have been done to save her. Remember, the Queen Mother lived up to the age of 101, passing away in 2002. Her husband lived until 99, passing away last year, and now the Queen herself at 96. I have worked as a geriatric doctor previously, or care of the elderly as it is called now, so I will give my input from that perspective as well. But first, let's go through some of the health issues that we know the Queen was suffering from. Officially, and to the public knowledge, she was not diagnosed with any long-term conditions at any point in her life. She lived to 96 and remained in relatively good health throughout her long life, 73 years of which she spent alongside her husband, Prince Philip. Some minor health incidents marked the beginning of her 70s, including a bout with the flu in 1993 and a horse riding accident in 1994, which left her with a broken wrist. She briefly used a walking stick in 2004 after knee surgery and spent a night in hospital in 2013 with gastroenteritis symptoms. As she got older, she resisted handing over official duties to other family members, believing that they could only be carried out by the monarch. She regularly appeared at public events and met foreign and domestic political leaders, making it clear that she intended to carry on the job until the end of her life. She also retained control of much of the royal family's business. She made sure Charles's wife Camilla would receive the title of Queen Consort, stripped her son Prince Andrew of his royal duties over child sexual abuse allegations, and navigated the controversy following a public falling out with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan. It was only recently, after Prince Philip's death in April 2021, that her own health issues began to affect her ability to fulfil her official duties. From late 2021, the Queen began to suffer what Buckingham Palace called episodic mobility issues and was seen using a walking stick on October 12, 2021 during a visit to Westminster Abbey. She nevertheless that month rejected the Oldie of the Year award. Her assistant private secretary telling the Oldie magazine, Her Majesty believes you are as old as you feel. As such, the Queen does not believe she meets the relevant criteria to be able to accept and hopes you will find a more worthy recipient. But as her health problems worsened, she spent a night in hospital for the first time since 2013 for some preliminary investigations. The spread of Omicron strain virus of COVID-19 also meant the Queen kept a low profile for much of the rest of 2021, cancelling a pre-Christmas lunch with extended family and spending Christmas at Windsor Castle instead of her usual choice of Sandringham House in Norfolk. In February 2022, she attended an in-person celebration of her Platinum Jubilee, marking 70 years on the throne. Later that month, she told members of the royal family she felt stiff when moving. Again, something certainly not unexpected for someone in the mid-90s. Even with all the precautions, the Queen could not dodge Covid forever. She returned a positive test on February 20th, 2022, but only came down with mild symptoms, and Buckingham Palace continued to reassure the public she was working in isolation. The Queen apparently had had all three Covid vaccines. The Queen performed only light duties following her bout with Covid and missed public events, such as Commonwealth Day services and the opening of the UK Parliament. But she did attend the opening of a new underground tube line in London, the Elizabeth Line, named in her honour. 
The final week. In the last week before she died, the Queen cancelled various scheduled virtual appointments. A new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, was appointed, but both the previous Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and Liz Truss travelled up to Balmoral Castle in Scotland, the first time a new Prime Minister of England was appointed in Scotland. This is possibly the last official picture taken of the Queen on the same day, just two days before she died. On September 8th, it was reported that doctors had become concerned for the Queen's health and family members were summoned to Balmoral where she passed away a few hours later. So what do I think was the actual cause of death or at least major contributing factors? Firstly, as obvious as it sounds, old age and frailty. This is something that we often put on death certificates. As we age and certainly past the age of 40, our organs begin to slowly die and lose functionality. In many brain scans we do of people in their 60s, for example, these will report nil significant but age-related small vessel damage. Similarly, the heart, lungs and kidneys all lose functionality year after year after 40 and overall we age, become more frail and our body's reserves to fight off illness or disease become significantly depleted. Secondly, was she suffering from long COVID? As mentioned, she had had COVID in February 2022. Long COVID is generally defined as still experiencing symptoms three months after the infection. Sometimes patients' lungs or hearts are left with residual damage. That being said, the Queen was still carrying out duties even just two days before she died, as can be seen in these pictures, and certainly was not bedbound. So something must have happened to cause the acute deterioration and death in the final 24 to 48 hours. In most cases, this is actually a chest infection, progressing to pneumonia if not promptly treated. This raises an interesting separate point. The Queen at all times had not just one designated physician, but a whole team of doctors looking out for her. There is no doubt they receive privileged treatment, as evidenced by Prince Philip at the age of 99 last year, in the weeks leading up to his death, having multiple treatments, including a cardiac procedure. As a doctor who's worked in cardiology on the NHS previously, I can tell you they would not do this for any other 99-year-old. We also see in America former presidents such as Jimmy Carter receiving active treatment well into the 90s and still plodding along. So why was the Queen not taken to hospital? Two possible reasons. One is that she may have had a terminal diagnosis that has never been disclosed and it would have been futile taking her to the hospital. Again, this is speculation, but certainly a possibility. Second is a term we call inanition, where a patient often gives up the will to live. I think having lost a husband of 73 years the previous year would have no doubt had a huge impact on the Queen. So many times we see this when a long-term partner dies, the other one soon dies too. We also saw this with Star Wars actress Carrie Fisher when she died in 2016. Her mother also passed away within 48 hours, saying, I want to be with Carrie before passing away. There is also a cardiological condition called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy or heartbroken syndrome where physiological changes in the heart, namely dilated cardiomyopathy, brings about a rapid acceleration in one's demise. Ultimately, it was the Queen's decision. She did not want to be taken to a hospital and treated. In my medical estimation, there was a gradual decline since losing her husband last year, mentally and physically, and despite her natural strength and fortitude, she decided that this was the end. Most likely, there was an infection, chest, urinary or otherwise, that both the Queen and the family decided not to fight aggressively, but rather keep her comfortable at her favourite home, Balmoral Castle. Again, as mentioned, this is just speculation and my opinion. Nothing official has been released so far, and they may never do so. Rather, natural causes and died peace is likely what will be mentioned as the official cause in the coming days and weeks. Now, there was a picture noted showing bruising of the Queen's hand a couple of days before she died, with some speculating that this could have been some kind of vascular disease. I would disagree. The bruising here, particularly in an older person with thinning skin, is very typical of a site where either a cannula was situated to give some kind of treatment or from where blood was taken. Now we come on to Lady Colin Campbell, apparently a royal biographer. Now she made a couple of videos around the time of the Queen's death, stating this. And I think we can also be grateful for the fact that her death was relatively painless. Bone cancer is not fun. She then goes on to categorically say that the Queen did indeed have bone cancer. She then also said, but she was fortunate enough to have the lesser of the forms of bone cancer. In the same video, the condition has been induced in part, according to people who know her well, has been created by the tremendous stress to which she has been subjected over the last three years, before going on to a tirade against Meghan and Harry, amongst some other people who I have no idea who they are, Jew-free, and so forth. Now, a few things to mention here. 
Given that Lady Campbell is a royal biographer, she probably has inside info and probably is correct in terms of the diagnosis. But that is where the accuracy of her statements end. Bone cancer can and usually is excruciatingly painful. In seeing thousands of patients with bone cancer, primary or with bony metastases, I have yet to come across a single one who simply had mild pain and then just passed away. Secondly, now I have to be honest, I've never really had an interest in the politics of the royal family, but the latter statement of stress and Meghan and Harry and whoever these other individuals are being a risk factor for bone cancer is again complete nonsense. The reality is we still do not know what causes primary bone cancer. Old age and certain inherited genes are thought to be risk factors but there is no evidence that stress, American or otherwise, induces, accelerates or exacerbates bone cancer. To the best of my knowledge stress is not a risk factor for any cancer full stop. Thirdly, again with cancer, it is seldom the cancer itself that kills, but rather the consequences of cancer. For example, a weakened and often immunocompromised immune system. Now in the context of bone cancer, it is often hypercalcemia or raised calcium levels in the blood, which can strike the fatal blow by causing kidney failure and a subsequent buildup of toxins in the body. Raised calcium can also affect the nerves, cause irregular heart rhythms, coma and death. That being said, I still stand by my initial estimation in the first video that it was an infection that struck the final blow just two days earlier. Boris Johnson, the previous Prime Minister, had met her and was surprised how quickly she declined. In a recent interview with the BBC, Boris Johnson mentioned she seemed very bright, very focused. Look, she was clearly not well and I think that was the thing that I found so moving. When we all heard about her death two days later, I thought how incredible that her sense of duty had kept her going in the way that it had. How amazing that she would be so bright and focused. It was a pretty emotional time. If the Queen did indeed have cancer, the Prime Minister would have no doubt have known, and his comments above allude to that. But he was also surprised as to her rapid demise, again pointing to the fact that it was likely an infection that killed her off. Yes, she may have had bone cancer and likely receiving long-term treatment for it, but she would have been greatly weakened by it, and a final decision to not fight any infection aggressively by taking her to hospital is likely what happened. Anyway, apologies again for the poor audio in the first video, but I hope you were able to understand this one more clearly. I'm not a biographer nor a professional YouTuber, just an overworked medic on a broken NHS. That being said, these videos do take a lot of time and effort, and those who have been around for a while will know that the content here is original. So if you could support the channel by hitting the like, subscribe and notifications button, that would be very much appreciated. There will be other videos on celebrity illnesses and deaths in the coming weeks. We also produce regular videos on day-to-day -day psychology. Until next time, stay safe.